someone using sophisticated equipment managed to briefly and illegally override broadcast signals on WGN-TV and WTTW. Jack Connerty reports now that both incidents are under investigation. On the 22nd of November, 1987, in the USA Chicago, two television station signals, one of which were broadcasting Doctor Who, were hijacked by what can only be presumed as a group of unknown hackers who to this day have not been identified nor have their motives ever come to light. This goes far beyond any Doctor Who conspiracy video I have ever done before because this is genuine and scarily so, very terrifying. With no answers and so many questions, this is my most unsettling video yet. Get ready as I delve into the creepy unsolved mystery of the Max Headroom hijacking incident. Quarters finally did. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you once again about the 30 to 10 victory they had over Detroit today out at Soldier Field. This was the first of the hijackings and was managed to be intercepted by the engineers working at the TV station. The second lasted a lot longer than 15 seconds. In fact, Without anyone being in the TV station building transmitting the scheduled signal, the second hijacking lasted for a whole minute and a half, only being stopped by the hijackers themselves, and is by far a lot more spine chilling, with no clear reason behind the interception, and no leads for the investigation team at the Federal Communications Commission to go on, taking them to a dead end. It was when the broadcasting of Doctor Who's The Horror of Fang Rock, featuring the fourth Doctor, Leela, and the Rutans, on WTTW at around 11.20 at night that the second and most famous hijacking took place. Warning, not suitable for a younger audience. You should talk often with the old ones of your tribe. That is the only way to learn. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. Oh, I can do some dry clothes. He does it. He's a freaking man. <laughs> I think I'm going to check some worse than that. Oh, Jesus. Tell a massive electric shock, he died instantly. The generator? Are you always so careful? Imagine being a child, sitting down watching Dog 2 and seeing that, unexpectedly being exposed to that and possibly anything else. But what was the motive? Who done it? Why does he strangely enough sound coincidentally like a Cyberman? And why was Dog 2 now entangled in the biggest hijacking of TV history? Well, before we delve into that, and the man behind the mask. Let's take a look at the mask itself. For those of us who weren't born in or are too young to remember the 80s, the mask is a copy of the head of Max Headroom. But who is he? Max Headroom came into being in 1985 and was the first computer generated TV presenter, or as is very topical in today's society, also known as an AI presenter. However, this was not possible in the mid 80s with its technology of the time. 
so an actor called Matt Thrower, who through the age of prosthetics and filming techniques, made it look as if he was computer generated, glitching and stuttering. He first appeared in the UK produced movie called Max Headroom 20 Minutes Into The Future, giving us his backstory in April 1985. Then, two days later, he hosted his own show called The Max Headroom Show, which involved bizarre interviews with celebrities and lasted for three series. In 1987, an American version simply called Max Headroom began airing on ABC, but was cancelled in his second year. In both shows, he openly challenges the corporation who run his dystopian world with sarcastic wit. Beyond the show, he appeared as a global spokesperson for what was called New Coke, with the phrase catch the wave, one of the terms used in the hijacking. Hi, Max Headroom here with... This is my guest. I heard you were big time in the old pop is. <laughs> well, I'm going to take that as a no comment. So, nitty gritty time. What I'm talking about, and you're not, is that more people prefer the new refreshing taste of Coke over Pepsi. Sweating? It's true. More people are, as we Cokeologists say, catching the wave. Catch it if you can, can. Catch the wave. Coke. <sighs> he also returned, aged but played by the same actor, to Channel 4 in 2007 and 8 to advertise the shift from broadcast to digital signals. In 2013's Eminem song, Rap God, Eminem resembled Max, and Max's last appearance to this day was in the 2015 movie, Pixels. Now we have gone over who exactly Max Headroom is, it is time to go over who this ominous Max impersonator could be, and what was their motives. Going off what we've been given, it can only be presumed there was no apparent motive for this hijacking, as to the unsuspecting viewer, it is 90 seconds of random but creepy rambling. Given that it takes a lot of intelligence and power to be able to hijack such a strong signal, it is surprising this time was used more effectively to spread some kind of misinformation or fear-mongering beyond the disturbance the hijacking caused. This was no random hijacking, as immense time and effort would have had to go into it as it was done using strong microwave transmissions which were sent to the station broadcast towers. They would have had to have considerable knowledge of how signals and broadcasting stations work to be able to hijack two stations. They also had to have had been in close range to the two stations and would have had to be somewhere in downtown Chicago where the two station towers were located. Not only this, but the final part was pre-recorded so they had time to think for exactly what they wanted to do. Could this have been impulsive thought and actions, or was it all part of the plan to mislead investigators into wild goose chases and dead ends? As discussed, one of the terms used in the hijacking was catch the wave, which the real Max Headroom used in the new Coke adverts, but what was the rest all about? Starting with the background, with what looks like metallic shutters, it is shifting behind him again, mimicking Max Headroom and the typical type of geometric background he had behind him. The first thing the hijacker mentions is Chuck Swirsky, and later, the world's greatest newspaper nerds. These two comments are linked, as Chuck was a sportscaster for WGN, what the hijacker called world's greatest newspaper nerds, the first station that was hijacked. It wasn't just what the hijacker said, but sung too. He sang the line, Your Love Is Fading, which is a song by The Temptations in 1966 called I Know I'm Losing You, then goes on to hum the theme tune, to a 1959 to 1960 children's cartoon called Clutch Cargo. Could this possibly be a hint towards this man's age? If he was born around the time the show would have aired and would be old enough to remember it at the time, then he would have been born around the mid 50s and therefore somewhere in his mid 30s by the time the hijacking took place. With Clutch Cargo in mind, he also either says I still see the X or I stole CBS, which is a television and radio network. If he said I still see the X, then this could be a reference back to Clutch Cargo, as there was an episode of the cartoon called Big X, or if not, then something to do with what he can see while being in control of the hijacking. But the masked hijacker is not the only one involved in this. What looks to be a woman in a mask at the end of the hijacking is a confirmed second person to be involved. Also, if his reference to his brother when talking about his dirty glove and him having the other is true, then most likely his brother is a third person involved at least. But why the broadcasting of Doctor Who? What has Doctor Who got to do with all of this? Why hijack Doctor Who and the property of the BBC? With all the reasons behind this disturbance being unknown, 
It cannot be said for sure, but it would seem Doc 2 was just unlucky enough to be the show spookily interrupted like the sports earlier that day. I don't believe it was a protest against anything to do with Doc 2 or the BBC, as this was in America, and considering it was at 11.20 at night, I also do not feel it was necessarily meant to scare children or families particularly either. But then again, with no one ever being caught and brought to justice for it, it cannot be answered for certain. Speaking of no one ever being caught, we now need to look into the possibility of who it could have been. With the reason behind the hijacking still to this day being a mystery, it makes it even harder to determine who did this. Was it a sophisticated hacker or someone who was employed by WGN and the reason there was a focus on the channel and Chuck Swirsky? One person who has been confirmed to be a previous hacker was John R. McDougall, also known as Captain Midnight. On the 27th of April 1986, he jammed HBO's signal with this. So could this be the Max Headroom hijacker as well? Well, when Captain Midnight hijacked HBO, it was with a clear reason and message, to protest against the price hike in their satellite dishes. After this, HBO contacted the FCC and they narrowed it down to 12 stations, which they were investigated and McDougall appeared as the prime suspect. With the help of a witness who overheard someone bragging on a payphone, they found the one guilty, McDougall. He committed the crime at his second job as he was an electrical engineer and was fined 5,000 US dollars and one year's unsupervised probation. He pleaded guilty. This means he technically could have been behind the hijacking. He grew up in the era of the hijacking, had the technology and fitted the age range. But, as mentioned, his reasons were clear and Max Hedron one was not. He worked alone, not with others, and lived in Florida at the time, not Chicago, so it is extremely unlikely to be him. The next is another eerily intriguing possibility, Eric Fournier. He was known as Shay St. John, a YouTuber who used a character made out of mannequin parts. Interesting link between his channel's mannequin and Doc 2's autons, seeing as Doc 2 was the show which was chosen to be hijacked. The videos, like the Max Headroom hijacking, are disturbing and surreal, but the channel was taken down by YouTube. He did not live too far from Chicago, and it is rumoured he was originally going to play some footage of him and his friends playing in the punk band he was in called The Blood Farmers. It is said he used the technology from a local TV station to record it, and with them being worried they would get caught, they just did this as a prank and did random stuff with him as Max Headroom. But even his bandmates had debunked this, with them saying it is ridiculous as he did not know anything about video editing, did not know anyone with degrees in mass communications and had zero access to broadcasting equipment. He died in 2010, age 42, and with him being too young to fit the profile and with no strong evidence, it is unlikely it was him either. The final possibility you really have to dig deep to find. As like with Doctor Rumours, it is on Reddit, posted in the year 2010 once again, but has mysteriously been redacted. Why this is, it is unknown. Maybe it was too close to the truth, perhaps. Their names are kept secret, but it involves two brothers named Jay and Kay, and have the title, I believe I know who's behind the Max Headroom incident that occurred on Chicago TV in 1987. The person said they grew up in Chicago in the early 80s and was part of the hacking scene. He believed the brothers were involved with Jay as the primary suspect. At a get together in 1987 in Chicago in an apartment owned by Kay, his girlfriend and a hacker called M, he saw an elaborate setup in the apartment. Jay had a disturbing and even sense of humour like the Max Headroom hijacker. He jumped around like Max and said oh instead of um like a lot of people normally would. At another party, Jay was there and the uploader and a friend who did not talk to anyone that day but he overheard Jay planning to do something big over the weekend. Big caught the guy's attention because he wondered what was big for their standards. At a pizza hut he asked and they just said watch Channel 11 tonight. He did watch it that night having forgotten about the conversation and saw it but did not work out this was the big thing which is surprising considering it originally piqued his curiosity. He suspected Max was Jay, his brother Kay, and the woman Kay's girlfriend. They were formally declared excluded as suspects and labelled his theory incorrect because it was almost impossible for it to be an outside job. After in 2015 having spoke to Rick Klein, who is the creator of the Museum of Classic Chicago Television, and confirmed this. So if it wasn't them, who was it? With it having been 36 years on, I don't think we will ever find out. 
it may well remain a mystery for the rest of time. Is the hijacker even still alive? What exactly was the purpose of this horrifying hijacking? Did New Who base their Cyberman voice on the hijacking? Was it a coincidence Doctor Who got hijacked or all part of a secret plan? What makes this conspiracy so petrifying is the fact that all these years on we haven't had one single answer. The culprit has never been caught and could still be out there. Is there something we have all missed? A hidden clue in the hijacking to give us answers? Because I've seen something. Something which could shed some light on this dark incident. And that is... Don't you agree?